gentlemen and ladies. It's my great pleasure to end the day speaking on behalf of the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. Uh, Andrew Holmes opened the day from the Academy of Science and the book ending by Andrew and me is about the incredible commitment of those two academies along with our sister academies to, to gender equity and more generally the issues raised by SAGE. I'm going to, um, as Ita noted, be the, the RAP speaker and to make a few remarks about the general space. In starting the RAP, I want to again salute and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and reflect the things that Donna Ingram said and inspired us with right at the start of the day. We, you know, there's a, there's a lot to say at the end of a, a great day like this. And at another level, there's not very much to say. In a way, everybody's said it all. A lot of this is going back over things. I mean, that great question, there might have been the roaring 80s, why are we back over the same points? But it's like a, a nautilus. We sort of go back over things, but hopefully at a new level. So a big thank you to our speakers, to our panelists, a particularly big thank you to the keynote speakers, Elizabeth Broderick, David Rubain, and of course, Ita Buttrose, the indefatigable Ita. A big thank you to Suzanne O'Reilly for um, setting the tone of the day, laying the foundations um, about the importance of gender equity and diversity being a national investment and highlighting it so well with her own personal stories. Katrina Jackson, who's coming into Universities Australia as the Deputy CEO, and we're great, it's wonderful to have her, painted the picture of what it's like to juggle so many things that seems to be the, the ongoing theme for women. Elizabeth Broderick made several really important points. She made the apt comment, the absence of women perpetuates the absence of women. She pointed out the universities and research systems have largely been designed by men for men. And Susan Pond picked up the same themes pointing out that we need to design out the problem that has no name. This is quite an interesting issue, that the, a problem that has no name when you're in universities. As I often say in press articles and in speeches, researchers are fantastic, not at just answering problems, but at problem definition. And why in this area of gender equity have we been so poor at problem definition? Thank you, Susan, for for highlighting the fact. Susan also highlighted the fact that so much discrimination is unconscious, but as came up later this afternoon, a lot of discrimination, as Aidan pointed out, is conscious too. Going back to some of the things Elizabeth said, she said there's a need to disrupt the existing system, and I'd like to echo that. And not to disrupt at once, but to keep disrupting. Some of you have heard me tell the story of how I gave a speech in Women's Day in Adelaide years and years ago, and I thought uh, there was no press there. And I said, now all of us should ask every day, what is the one strategic thing we've done today? And um, the press was there, and the front of the Adelaide advertiser the next morning says, Vice Chancellor says, what is the strategic thing we each do um, each day? Well, similarly, what is the disruptive thing we've done each day to disrupt the system with regard to gender equity? Alan Finkel pointed out that universities and research organisations need to model the society we want for tomorrow. And I think that is a really important point. Universities are supposed to be model institutions, supposed to be examples of good philosophy, of good ethics. And therefore, we really do need to very consciously model what we want for the future. Emma Johnston, as came on to the panels, Emma pointed out that we need to mainstream gender equity and it needs to be the new norm, that men need to be mainstream gender equity, that that needs to be the thing that they see just as part of the job description. 
As I said, the two academies are very committed to this space, and Peter Koopman and David Toner illustrated how that commitment is working out in practice with, with the Academy of Science and, and the Tech Sciences Academy. And of course, we've drawn great um, inspiration from the UK, and David, David Rubain, thank you very much for coming out and for being so generous in sharing what's happened in the UK in this area um, with us and allowing us to move forward and to get a great system going here. And then we've had a couple of great panels. Um, before afternoon tea, a panel examining diversity and reminding us that diversity is a very rich space, a scarily rich space, and often paid rather, rather simplistic lip service to, but really needs very deep attention if we are going to harvest those riches. After afternoon tea, we had the panel with the institutions, funding institutions, a policy institution. And the words, just picking up some of the words of that, um, reflective of opportunity, research reflective of opportunity, bias training, what can small organisations do, the importance of data. I'm not going to go and talk about that, one of my very favourite topics. The importance of language, my, my probably most favourite topic, and I won't dwell on that, and the very great importance of culture, and it's all about culture. And then we heard from Ita Buttrose, uh, an absolute, I was going to say queen, but an absolute star in the Australian firmament, reminding us of so much of what has happened, what has been achieved, and the sort of wonderful person such as Ita who can achieve it. It was interesting hearing her talk about the, the, the need to make a conscious, conscious decision to play in the jungle. I think that's so right. Women, men, everyone needs to make that decision and to remake it because going into the jungle can be quite scary. And she's so right about saying that so many women don't know how good they are. I'm not sure that everyone likes being shoved, but it's probably a good idea that people like Ida are around shoving them because it just, we wouldn't get people into positions unless we shove people. So maybe that's something everyone should do every day, say, who have I shoved today? Just be a little <laughs> aware of the bullying principles and we'll, and we'll see. But now to a few thank yous. Um, the academies thank the sponsors of the SAGE Symposium, our principal sponsor, Universities Australia, as well as the Office of, for Women in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, La Trobe University, uh, EY, L'Oreal and Flinders University. Thank you to the um, National Maritime Museum for hosting us in this wonderful venue. Thank you, Lee. Lee Dayton's one of those people you always turn to first when you have a day like this. She moderates so skillfully and, um, and is somebody who is there in the background pushing these issues in ways that people, I think, don't always recognise. What have I shoved today? Yes, well, <laughs> I'm standing a bit close. Just be careful, girl. Um, we'd like to also acknowledge the uh, institutional sponsors of the SAGE program. Um, the Office of the Commonwealth Chief Scientist, thank you, Alan. Um, the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, as well as the fellows of both academies, and of course, the wonderful CEOs of the academies, Sue Meek and Margaret Hardy, um, Hartley. And um, some very special fellows who are donors to the SAGE program, Brian Schmidt, Nalini Joshi, Tanya Munro, Mahand Andro Dasgupta, and Kate Smith-Miles through their respective ARC Georgina Sweet Australian Laureate Fellowships, and also a very special thanks to the support of Terry and Sally Speed. So that generous support has made SAGE possible. We also noted through the day, and particularly at the start, the fact that we um, will have welcomed eight new institutions into the Athena Swan Charter. It's wonderful to have seen the whole numbers involved in SAGE grow from the pilot with six institutions in 2014 to now having three quarters of the higher education sector in there, joining many other institutions in higher ed and research institutions. And yes, Aidan, there's a few to go. Um, and yes, Margaret, we heard why they are yet to come in. There's a lot more to come. 
I mean, one thing that has been very important in this program has been valuing diversity. And a great thing about the Australian program has been the particular focus on Indigenous Australians, something that's very, very important. But also looking at other underrepresented groups across gender, race, culture, sexuality, disability, social identity and experience. SAGE is looking to continue its fruitful collaboration with the Equality Challenge Unit in the UK as we grow our Athena Swan Charter in our respective nations, here and there. SAGE is also looking to find new pathways to collaborate with a range of peak funding bodies, um, including, of course, the ARC and the NHMRC, who spoke today, and leading institutions um, such as Universities Australia, who's very much there, the Human Rights Commission, represented by Tim so well here today, um, male champions of change, pride in diversity, and other institutions who've taken an interest and provided quieter support. The Athena Swan Charter will draw on this wealth of expertise, not just for the sake of institutional policy transformation, but to improve the lives of everybody who gets involved with this program. There are many challenges and many opportunities um, that the SAGE pilot has sort of opened up and is now moving into the wider area beyond the pilot. And um, under the stewardship of the two um, academies I mentioned, and with Elizabeth Broderick leading the expert advisory group, SAGE charter members can feel assured that the vision for a sustainable program is in good hands. In conclusion, though, I just want to reflect on a few things that have come up today again, and it came up again here this afternoon. And one is the lessons of history. And that question to Ita, why are we going back? Why are we facing the same sorts of issues? And it's that old issue, unless we had a good grasp of history, so we really do want to talk to the, our friends in the, academies of the, the Academy of the Humanities, um, unless we have a strong grasp of the history, we will be damned to re-experience it and rewrite it. I mean, I'm horrified that one battle that we seem to be refighting is the short-term contract issue. In 2000, 2001, the Industrial Relations Commission put out the Heckey Award, and that was meant to completely deal with that issue once and for all. The work that commission put into getting vice chancellors and senior members of universities to understand the importance of, get, of the short-term contract or the, the, the problems of the short-term contract was immense, and a lot of people signed up. The fact we're back here talking about it so much is appalling. It's, but sometimes, actually, you do need to revisit history to reinvigorate an idea. And I'm particularly here, was thrilled to hear um, Aidan talking about ROPE, Research Opportunity Performance Evaluation. It echoed so much the thing I am most proud of in my career, which was inventing the term early career researcher, which was very much about the same ideas. And those ideas have worked out, but in some ways got a bit tired in how they were being implemented and people were cutting around the corner. And therefore, ROPE, a much nicer acronym, I have to say, than ECR. Um, it's great to have that coming forward and to hear that being talked about so well and to hear people saying it has an effect. Another thing that I think is important to talk about is about being blunt and not only ask what you're doing today, but that issue, again, some of you have heard me talk about, the importance of women staking their own claim in Ita's words, knowing how good they are. And one important thing I've often said is that women need to negotiate about conditions and pay and not be scared of it. And I'm immensely proud of a senior woman in this room today who got a senior role relatively recently and who did an incredible amount of homework and got a not bad package. She set an example for us. The trouble is a lot of these packages are silent. Talking of pay, talking of conditions, through the day, a colleague of mine in one of the universities not too far from here has been sending me the odd email and has pointed out that she would have liked to have been here. But today at her university, there's the seminar for promotion to professor. She's sent me the numbers. There was, this is the second of a couple of um, seminars. The first one that was held 
had 21 people at it. 18 were men and three were women. None of the, only one woman came, sorry, 16 were men and four were woman, women and only one came back after lunch. The others just decided it wasn't for them. There's a second version on today, 21 are there, 18 men and three women. And we talk about the problem of having too few women going through from the junior levels to the senior levels. What's going on? So unless women are willing to take that step, whether it's jumping into the jungle or just being pussycats taking the, going to a few um, promotion to seminar um, examples, women do need to step forward. It's an important part of the gender. Everyone needs to step forward, women and men. I also think it's important that we are proactive personally, not only on our own behalf, but on behalf of the systems we're in. And again, many of you have heard me tell the story of the University of Canberra when Roger Scott was Vice-Chancellor way back in the late 80s, when Canberra had been just put under the ACT government, taken from the Commonwealth. And Roger and the ACT government said that all committees under ACT government were to be gender balanced. And the university assumed it was exempt. And Roger said, we're not. Even if we were going to be, we won't be. And the whole place said, well, you can't run a university on gender balance committees. The council has all sorts of things that says so many people under this category. The academic board has so many people from this category. Promotion, um, appointments panels. You need um, people, you know, there's only most of the professors are male. They'll, they'll be the ones chairing and being the senior. Roger said, no, all, everything in this university is gender balanced. And so the academic board was gender balanced, all the committees were gender balanced, the buildings and site committee, et cetera, et cetera. And the women, so there were women from very junior ranks on very senior committees. And for the first few meetings, often they were a bit quiet. By a few meetings, they thought, mm, I know about this issue, and they'd get up and they'd say, um, hang on, I, you know, I think we should be thinking this, or we should be doing that. And after a while, they, were the, they really found their voices. But of course it was Canberra, and it was a time when the public service was growing, and these people thought, I'm pretty good. I'm actually better than I thought I was. So they put up their hands for senior roles in the Commonwealth Public Service, and Canberra, which had been not too bad on the gender statistics, actually went backwards, but boy, it was a good experiment. We should occasionally congratulate ourselves for things we do. In Australian universities, we have moved on. We have 10 female vice chancellors at the moment. It's not a gigantic growth from where we were about 15 years ago, but it is a growth. We have um, re some, well, give me, I'll give you the numbers, 13 female deputy vice chancellors research, six female deputy vice chancellors corporate, 15 Deputy Vice-Chancellors International. We're much better in the academic side and have 21 DVCAs. So that's pretty impressive. But we had that statistic that's been running through today that it, there's a lot of women at the junior levels in academic life and relatively few at the senior levels. The Australian public sector has been better and if you look at its statistics, it has grown more. And a lot of that has to do with targets and mentors. And I think we can learn from that, but of course that's a single system, not a multiple diversity of systems that the universities are. We can also, I think, look to what we see as the future. The point that Alan was making about envisaging the future being organisations of the future and looking to Australia more generally. When New Zealand had that wonderful phase where it had uh, a, a female Prime Minister, a female Governor General and a female Chief Justice. We've never got there. And also, where's the head of the Army, the head of the Reserve Bank, the head of PMNC? Why are there not more women on boards? Um, why are there not more female CEOs? It's something we still need to aim at. Also, why are there not more women winning, winning Nobel Prizes? or winning the other big international prizes like the Japan Prize. We need to say what we think and we need to go about nominating and doing whatever is needed. We need to have a new cultural normality. I think it's amazing that people talk about men and 
paternity leave and issues as though they're something special. As many of you know, I do a lot of work in the Nordic countries so the, through my company. And there, it's not about the CV of women saying, and I'm always assessing people and research institutions and things, and their CVs typically will say, you know, one year paternity leave, um, three months paternity leave, a couple of years on. And it's just part of the CV, men and women. It's maternity leave, paternity leave, or parent carer leave, and carer leave too. It's not just um, for, for new children. It's just normal. Why is it not normal here? More generally, I think we need to have a new normal. We need to, within the wonderful SAGE project, I think spell out what the new normal is. And we have to keep with this problem. We must remain with it. And we mustn't leave until we've got it sorted out. Thank you.